to open your word. I pray you'd bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of the sermon here, Little Children, the Lord's Sovereignty, and Lost Sheep. So what I want to do with this passage, Matthew 18, 1 to 14, is I want to show, what we're going to do is we're going to see Jesus is preparing his disciples. And I know Steve and Scott have been emphasizing this as well as we go through this part of Matthew. We're now headed toward the cross. Don't take these passages as some timeless truth, although you can find timeless truths in this passage. This passage is still Jesus preparing his disciples for what's about to happen. This radical thing that's about to happen that they do not expect, which is him being betrayed, arrested, crucified, and killed and laid in a tomb. So he's, there's going to be a radical change in what they think the kingdom of heaven is supposed to be, and he's preparing them for that. And how does he do this? How does Jesus do this in this section? Well, number one, he talks about childlike faith, which consists in humility, and we're going to talk about that. He talks about the inevitability of the sin and suffering that's about to occur and our responsibility in resisting that sin. And that's kind of going to be the heart of this message is we're going to talk about something called compatibilism. It's a fancy philosophical term, but it's very important to understand how the Bible teaches that. And then we're going to see how does Jesus seek out the sheep who stray in light, about what, in light of what's going to happen. Because as we're going to see, Peter completely misses the whole thing, as do the other apostles, and they stray, and Jesus has to seek them out. They, they do not obey anything Jesus says here. They really don't. The apostles are still as puzzled as anyone else as to what's going on. So let's start with, and, and I do apologize, I have my NIV because I could not find my ESV, so if that's a mortal sin, Steve, I will go to confessional with you after the uh, service. Um, So at that time, on Matthew 18, verse 1, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So this comes up all over the Gospels, right? The disciples seem to always have this argument about who's the greatest. Why? Because they think that when this kingdom actually comes, there's going to be some positions doled out. There's going to be some things that are going to have to be run. I mean, Jesus can't do this by himself, right? We got to... He's going to have to have those lieutenants and all this. And they're arguing about it all the time, it seems. And they, but this time they're pretty bold with it. Other times Jesus kind of calls them out because he knows they're talking about it secretly. This time they're bold about it for some reason. Maybe because they just got off of the Mount of Transfiguration and Peter, James, and John are like, yeah, man, you should, yeah, man. You know, they still talked about it, even if he told Peter, James, and John not to say anything. I guarantee you the 12 still had a little secret conversation about it. But anyway. Who's going to be the greatest? So what does Jesus do in light of this question, right? He does what? Verse 2. He calls a little child and had him stand among them. He said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change a strong... Unless you're converted and become like a little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So this reminds me of John 3, just to point that out. Okay, there is a connection between the Gospel of John and the other Gospels, which some scholars will be like, well, no, it's just totally different. No, it's exactly what John said. Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. Or he says the kingdom of God in John, but same thing. You can't see it. So there's a radical change that needs to occur with the disciples if they're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, this is, salvation's at stake, right? Isn't that what that means? Entering, if you're not entering the kingdom of heaven, what's that mean? You're not saved. So we could talk about all kinds of characteristics of children here. I, I went over all these commentaries, and a lot of these commentaries will you know, take all the, oh, here's how a child is, and here's what childlike faith should be. But I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on the characteristic that Jesus points out, which is humility. And what is it about a child? Humility and trust in the midst of suffering. That's humility and trust in the midst of suffering. That's the childlike quality. So, for example... What if there was a massive explosion outside this building right now that caused chaos or a massive thunderstorm? Any of you that have small children, what would they instinctively do if they were frightened by some chaotic thing? Where would they run to? To your parent. And what would you do? You would trust that the parent's going to protect you, right? Okay, my parent knows what's going on. They're going to give me instructions, whatever. Small children instinctively do that. Now, it's actually tragic 
that some small children don't instinctively do that because of abuse and neglect. It is, it's, it's, it's horrible. That does happen. But generally, a child will run to the person who will protect them. Okay? Here's another classic one. And I wasn't involved in this. Kim did all the stuff with the little kids. When you take your child to get a shot, a small child who has no idea what's going on, what is the child? The child's crying because you've taken them to a room where a person is going to stick something in them that's going to hurt them, and you're letting it happen. Ah, I don't want to get a shot, but why don't you protect me from this? No, we're gonna, I'm, letting, I'm, letting the man, I'm letting the nurse come in and give you that shot. It's going to hurt. Right? We willingly inflict pain on our children for their greater good, do we not? We're not talking about the COVID vaccine, by the way, so don't, you know, I'm not going to go on a rant about the COVID. I'm just talking about, in general, you know, you know, certain vaccines that we get our children, okay. For the greater good, we inflict pain on them, and they don't understand why. That is what Jesus is talking about here, in the context. A massive amount of pain is about to be inflicted on him by the Father. Don't forget that connection. Okay, and I, I, I was texting Steve about, in our other text, why they don't translate the term child in Acts chapter 4, which I think it's the word for child when it talks about Jesus being put to death by Pontius Pilate and the, the, the Romans. There's a sense in which Jesus is also talking about his relationship with the Father. And Jesus is about to show them what childlike faith is. Because Jesus is going to fully just hand himself over to the will of the Father for him. And he's telling his disciples, you need to do the same. You need to have this childlike faith. So the disciples are about to see this. And it's interesting, the, the whole tying the millstone around the neck and being drowned in the sea, that part. Um, wait, let's read that. And whoever welcomes a little child in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, or see, I don't like the NIV translation there. It, it, it doesn't necessarily have to do with sin. It's to stumble. The Greek word is scandalon, which actually is where we get the English word scandal. And it has nothing to do with what the original Greek really meant. <laughs> when you think of a scandal, it's like, oh, what happened? What, what happened in the, in the White House or whatever? Um, but if anyone who caused one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. So, it's interesting, right? That was, a, that was one method of Roman execution, actually. Uh, they would, and actually, that's a, I would rather be executed that way than crucified, personally. Um, but Jesus is saying the seriousness of what he's about to teach. It's very serious. Because he's telling them, listen, the most important event in all of the history of mankind is about to happen. And you need to trust me that the seriousness of this, and he's also addressing the 12 with Judas there. And we're going to talk about Judas here in a minute. Now, let's go to verse 7. I'm not, we're not, there's more to say about those verses, but we'll, we'll retroactively say stuff about them. Now, verse 7. This is what I want to focus on. Woe to the world because of things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. I want to focus on that phrase. So, these things that are about to happen, these things that cause stumbling, and he's clearly talking about the cross in the context. Now, we can make this a general principle, which we will. But woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Now, here's the two things. Such things must happen. They're inevitable, some translations say. These things have to happen, is the first thought. Second thought. But woe to the one through whom they come. So wait a minute, Dave. So what is this about? So how can these two statements be reconciled? So you're saying that this evil thing, this bad thing, it's going to happen. There's no possible way it's not going to happen. It's going to happen. So this person has no choice. Nope. They're going to do it. It's going to happen. But then you just said woe to them. So they're responsible for the thing that they can't help but do? Yes. 
And it's always been the puzzle about Judas, right? You ever thought about Judas? Could he have not betrayed Christ? Was it possible for him to not betray Christ? Well, yeah, he could have not betrayed. Well, then how would the cross happen? And we're going to talk about that. That's what we're going to focus on now for the next, the middle part of the summer. Okay. So we're going to get into a little philosophy stuff, but I think I can walk you through it and help you understand it and why it's so important. Okay. So, and I'm I'm pretty sure I can speak for the elders here, that we hold to what's called compatibilism. Now, here's what I mean by that. The Bible teaches that God, on the one hand, is completely sovereign, so sovereign in his providence that every single thing that occurs on this planet in time and space, all the choices of humans, all the natural disasters, all the hurricanes, everything that happens, every single thing that happens right now is totally, completely determined by his divine decree. He has planned it all out. He is in control of all of it. Nothing happens outside of his sovereign will. Nothing at all, including sin. Okay, that's the one statement. Statement number two, yet we are held responsible for the sins we commit. But yet at the same time, God has determined that these sins be committed, yet we are held fully responsible for them. That is called compatibilism. Why? Because we believe the Bible teaches it's compatible for those two statements to be true at the same time. But Dave, that's a contradiction. We're going to talk about that. Before I talk about that, let me talk about what's called incompatibilism. Okay, so if you're taking notes, compatibilism is the idea that there's this one thing, God is sovereign, but humans are genuinely free and responsible. Two, incompatibilism. There's two types of this. The, most, the, the more rare one is called determinism. Determinism means everything's determined, K, sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. It's all predetermined. Anyone ever watch like Terminator? Or like, you know, these, there's so many movies that play with this idea, right? And actually, this artificial intelligence, right? You know, is Skynet going to... Can Skynet ever not come and terminate? No, it doesn't matter what they do. It's determined that Skynet will arise, this artificial intelligence. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter how much they try to change. But yet there's a sense in which they're making these choices as well all along the way to try to stop it. So there's a lot of movies that toy with this. But determinism is the idea that everything's determined. We're just a bunch of robots. Okay, there's very rare people that, that believe that within the Christian church. The more, so it's incompatible in determinism that it can be, God can be in control of everything and man can be free. That's not able to be reconciled. So it's just incompatible. Can't do it. The second form is the most popular form in the evangelical Christian church in America. It's called libertarianism. That is the idea that there's some things that are determined, but most things are not determined. It's, you cannot reconcile the idea that God's determined everything and man is free. So what do they say? We are free. The choices we make, God has nothing to do with them. We make choices. That's what we do. God doesn't really have a plan. He might have a general plan, but he doesn't have specific purposes like that that control everything we do. Okay? Well, we're going to see, and this sounds, this sounds crazy. I just want to give you a heads up as to why this concept is so important. If you're in the midst of suffering and you are a libertarian type person, your bottom will fall out on your Christian faith. Because all you'll be able to do is say, well, God didn't really want this to happen. And he's just as upset as I am. But that's about as far as we can go with God. And now, thankfully, most pastors who are libertarians do not act like one in that situation. They really don't. They'll say things like, well, God has a plan for this. They'll quote Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. Even though they never preach that, they'll pastorally care for you that way, which is good. Okay? But we want to know, how can I be comforted in the midst of suffering? Just like the disciples are being comforted in the midst of suffering. And does this sound like they're being comforted by Jesus? Woe to you for all these stumbling blocks. But he actually is. He's actually comforting them. Okay, now let me try this. What's a okay? There's three categories here. If you want, to, if you're taking notes, contradiction, antinomy, and paradox. Okay, what's a contradiction? 
A contradiction is a direct and unresolvable opposition between two statements, laws, or principles. They just can't be true. So I, got, I always got to pick on Steve, uh, on Steve. Here's a contradiction, and his wife can confirm this. Steve is a married bachelor. Can both those statements be true? No, he's either what? Married or he's a bachelor. Steve cannot be a married bachelor, okay? So see that? Very simple illustration. That's a contradiction. It's two statements that cannot be reconciled, okay? What's an antinomy? An antinomy is two contradictory statements, but they both seem equally true and necessary. So you, it's like, it's this unresolvable place where you're stuck. It's like, this can't be a contradiction, why? Because both of these statements have to be true, but that's as far as you can go, okay? That's called an antinomy. What's a paradox? And that's really what we're talking about. Now, this is more of a scientific term. It's not more of a, it's a, less of a philosophical term, but yeah, nevertheless, a direct but resolvable opposition between two true statements. So I got two really cool examples, okay? Here's the statement. A circle is a triangle, and a triangle is a circle. No, it's either a circle or it's a triangle. Because, right, what's the properties of a circle? It's round, it doesn't have any corners, it doesn't have any points. A triangle it has points and corners. How can we resolve that? We do one simple thing, we add another dimension. Some of you guys that are thinkers, how can a triangle be a circle and a circle be a triangle in the same thing? It's called a cone. You add a third dimension. If it, actually, a cone is nothing but a bunch of circles that progressively get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until they form a point at the top. So you add another dimension. Okay, that one's a little heady. This one's, e this one's easier. The distance between, and if there's any flat earthers in the room, uh, you won't agree with this analogy. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if there are any. The distance between San Francisco and Tokyo is 5,225 miles. But also the distance between San Francisco and Tokyo is 4,853 miles. How's that not a contradiction? What do you mean? It's either one or the other. It's either, either 5,225 a port or 4,853. You add another dimension. So in a straight line, Okay, versus in a curve, because the earth is round. Yeah. So in a curve, so in the curvature of the earth, it takes how long to get from San Francisco to Tokyo? 5,225 miles. But if you went, started in San Francisco and went straight through the earth to Tokyo, it's less of a distance. Does that one help? So, well, Dave, what the heck are you talking about though? Because the Bible functions in this paradoxical way. And we, if we don't understand this, this is where a lot of liberalism in the church comes from. Well, you, you just can't reconcile this stuff, so that must mean the Bible is a man-made document. No. You have to understand that God dwells in a different dimension than us. Okay? Here's a book. And no, my dog didn't chew this up. This is how I got it in the mail. So, watch when you buy from these used bookstores, but it's fine. It was only five bucks. It's called Beyond the Cosmos by Hugh Ross. It's a really good book. The Transdimensionality of God, which is, he talks about how, you know, physicists have said there's, what, 20 dimensions? I don't even know. They've lost count. But all this stuff, he talks about how you can age. You know they do studies about how aging happens in space? And there's some physicists that theorize that you could only age 30 years over a million years of our time in certain parts of the galaxy. It's just great. Like, so it's, there's a lot of stuff. But that's where I got these analogies. Now, Dave, this makes no sense to me. Okay. The Bible functions in this type of way with many doctrines. And almost all doctrines that fall into heresy, especially the cardinal core doctrines like the doctrine of the Trinity and the deity and humanity of Christ, they, now, the, what's, the, what's the more ancient biblical term for what I'm talking about? Mystery. Mystery is more the, the biblical term for this paradox. It's the idea that God functions in a separate 
time space continuum and there's truths that are revealed in scripture that you're not going to be able to reconcile because you're not God but you bow the knee to that revelation why because it's in revelation right which by the way you know one of the most important doctrines that will put you in the minority sadly in the American Christianity is that this book in front of you is the inerrant, inspired, infallible, authoritative word of God and everything it says is true. You're the minority. Well, Dave, what do you mean? There's these mega churches with 10,000 people. I'm telling you, many people would go there. They don't, they, you know, they'll take a little bit of Bible here and there, but when it comes to this trumps everything else you think about reality, no, I don't think so. All right, so if you got your Bibles, we're going to do a little quick Bible study. Of course, I might have enough time. We'll see. Two hours, I right, see. <laughs> this is the first seminar. This is the pre-seminar before your seminar. Okay. So let's look at some Bible verses about this idea of compatibilism. So let me bring this back. We're talking about when Jesus says, woe to the world. These stumbling blocks must come, but woe to the person who does them. Right. So look at Exodus chapter three, verse 21. Here's an easy one. I'll give you a minute to turn there. Exodus 3.21. So now we want, we're going to look at three examples. Three examples of compatibilism. Where two explanations are given that seem to be contradictory, but they're actually complementary. So in Exodus 3.21... God says to Moses, this is at the burning bush when God is calling Moses to rescue the people from Egypt, right? He says, and I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people so that when you leave, you will not go empty handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. And then flip a couple pages. Exodus 1233 is the fulfillment of that. 1233, the Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise they said we will all die. So the people took their dough. Wait a minute. The is okay, verse 35. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for gold and articles of silver and clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and they gave them what they asked for so that they plundered the Egyptians. Now, what is necessary? Is, is it is it sufficient to say the only explanation for this is that God made the Egyptians favorable toward the Israelites? No. That's only one thing. Flip it on the side. Is it, oh, is it, is it sufficient to say the only reason this happened is because the Israelites asked the Egyptians for this stuff? No. Both explanations are necessary to make sense. This is compatibilism. It's compatible to say that God does something in his sovereignty and human beings do something in their freedom, right? They asked. God commanded that it happen, made them favorable, and they asked. Okay, that's a pretty straightforward one because it's just about people giving each other money and stuff. But now let's look at Genesis chapter 45 and the story of Joseph. Now I assume that most of you in here know the story of Joseph. A completely evil and vile and disgusting action on the part of Joseph's brothers, and these are the patriarchs of Israel, by the way, where they see their brother that they're jealous of, and they decide, well, first they want to murder him. And God restrains that through the oldest, right? He's like, no, we're not going to murder him. But they, first they want to murder him. And then they decide instead to throw him in a pit, leave him there to die, but then... Someone has a bright idea. Well, let's sell them to this, these Egyptians. They're these traders. That they sell people to the Egyptians. Let, let's sell them to him. So they sell their own brother into slavery in Egypt where he ends up. To the, to the heartbreak of their father. So then they go home. And they have this whole charade where they take the coat of many colors, dip it in blood, and rip it apart. And they say, look, your, your son was killed by a wild animal. And they keep up that lie for years and years. And years. So, so don't, don't think that was just this one action that happened and then that's the end of it. Can you imagine if you were the one of the brothers? You just kept up the lie. Watching your father weep that his son is dead. And you know he's not. I mean, isn't that evil? 
That's horrible. And Joseph is sold into slavery. Think of an equivalent in our society where people go undergo horrible treatment from other human beings. It's terrible, right? It's horrible. People suffer at the hands of other human beings on this planet, don't they? Immense suffering. Horrible suffering. Okay? What's Joseph's explanation of this suffering? Okay? So what do we have? We have the, the brothers making these choices that they made of their own volition to say, we are going to murder. No, let's throw them in a pit. No, let's sell them in slavery. Look at Genesis 45, verse 3. So and it's, there's a backstory to this. You know, if, you, if you don't know the story, I encourage you to read it. It'll probably take you, you know, 30, 45 minutes this afternoon to read the story of Joseph. And this is right where Joseph... So Joseph, they haven't recognized Joseph yet. They came to Egypt to get food because there's a famine. And Joseph's been toying with them. He's been toying with them, basically. But now he finally reveals himself to them. And look what it says, 45, verse 3. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. So can you imagine? Like, oh my gosh, it's, it's Joseph... He's still alive and, and he's in charge of everything. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. So Joseph very clearly articulates who's to blame in terms of the choices being made that he's now in Egypt. See that you sold me into Egypt. But then look what he says. It's absolutely amazing. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Huh? Did you hear what Joseph just said? Who sent him to Egypt? God. Now we're back to compatibilism, aren't we? Is it a sufficient explanation for why Joseph's in Egypt to just talk about what his brothers did? And that's all? No. No. Not according to this text. Is it sufficient to just say God sent him to Egypt? No, God didn't just send an angel and teleport Joseph to Egypt, did he? I guess God could have done that if he wanted. The sufficient explanation, compatibilism, is God sent him to Egypt and his brother sent him to Egypt. Doesn't that sound like a contradiction? It's got to be one or the other. No, it's both. That's why we believe compatibilism is the Bible teaches both. Now, some people just reject that and say, well, now just means God allowed it. No, it just God kind of saw the opportunity and went with it. No, that's not at all what Joseph's saying. Joseph is seeing the sovereign hand of God in this plan. And what's the reason why God had this plan? To save them from famine. And then just, just for good measure, for two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be neither plowing nor reaping, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Now, here's an important point, application point. When you live the could Joseph have said this when he first got to Egypt? Could Joseph have said this when he found himself falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and sitting in a jail? I don't know. Right? Before Joseph saw the full fulfillment, you think he could have uttered these words? Maybe not. But now that he sees the fulfillment, he can. Many of you that are in the midst of suffering, you won't know the reason for it till the end. If God is gracious, he might give you some reasoning in this life. And that's gracious of him. But you know, many times the suffering we undergo, when we, when we are glorified, God will show us and we will go, wow, that had to happen. That horrible thing that happened to me had to happen. Yes, God, I see it now. But what should we do now? Walk by faith and say, God, I know you're sovereign and I know this is part of your plan and I will trust you rather than saying God is not sovereign. Free will runs the show, which is what most people functionally live by. And I live by, I have to crucify that part of me. I, I think that all the time too. I don't, I don't snap into God, what are you doing here? I just get mad. This isn't going the way I want. Instead of God, I know your providence is here. I just get mad about it. So it's a, it's a constant battle. But to walk by faith to say, God, I know this is part of your plan. That's what Joseph's doing. Now just write this, Genesis 50 verses 19 to 21. We don't have time to do that. We'll skip that. 
for sake of time. But it's, it's basically the same statement. He says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He says, Joseph says that to his brothers. Now, Acts chapter 4. Turn there. That was one of the readings Steve did. This is the, this is the really important one. For compatibilism. Acts chapter 4. Starting at verse 23. So, and how I'm going to wrap this text back into Matthew 18 is... This is the believers, this is the disciples transformed into now looking at their suffering the way Jesus told them to in Matthew 18. That's what this text is. They are experiencing suffering from the same group that that crucified Jesus. And they are taking it in a totally different way than they did when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane and ran away. Okay, so what happens? Context. Peter and John are dragged in before the Sanhedrin and they're told, you better stop preaching in this name. You're causing all this trouble. And of course, they boldly say, whether we're going to obey man or God, that's you you decide, but we're going to keep preaching what we've heard and seen. Okay, so on their release, they go back and find the other disciples, it says. Peter and John went back. And they told him what had happened. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Okay, stop. This is very classic in the Psalms. And the apostles, just they're just continuing this tradition. When I am afraid, when I have anxiety, when I'm worried, when I don't know what's going on, I can just remember that the God I worship created the universe. Isn't it amazing, the, the total solar eclipse, just for a second, that God basically revealed his existence to so many people, and they even, they're, they're just suppressing that truth, as it says in Romans 1. But do you know all the things that have to be perfectly calibrated for that to even occur a total solar eclipse the size of the sun the size of the moon the size of the earth the distance between the sun and the moon the distance between the moon and the earth and there's like 50 other ones and there's no like that there's they, that actually odds are that uh, total solar eclipse doesn't happen anywhere in the known galaxy anywhere else it just can't what do you mean dave the galaxy is massive i know but the chances of those things aligning in perfect harmony like that are are very rare So what's that telling us? God is real. Anyway, so notice how they cry out to God is what? Not redeemer at first. What do they call him? Creator. So do that sometimes. It's very healthy spiritually. Wake up in the morning and say, God, you are an amazing God. That this universe functions the way it does. The beauty and the power I see in it. Now, what do they say? You spoke by the Holy Spirit through your mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers together against the the Lord and against his anointed one. Psalm 2, right? And that's what's happening. The rulers are taking their stand against the message of the gospel. And they're being threatened with persecution. They actually get flogged later and they rejoice in it. I do not have that faith, I will admit, in front of you all. If I got dragged out of here by some Gestapo thing and they whipped me with like so badly I couldn't even barely walk and I was bleeding everywhere and my back was ripped open and I came back, Dave, what do you have to say about your beating you just recently got? I rejoice, I'm counted worthy to suffer for the day. I would say, where's Edgar Snyder? Where's the, where's the number? Anyway, he's a, he's a personal injury attorney, just in case you didn't catch the reference there. Okay. So they, they're called, so they're, they're, Psalm 2 is the, what they're experiencing is the fulfillment of Psalm 2. It's, it's, it's the, the, the anointed one and his church who he's filled with his spirit that's going on and bringing the kingdom is being resisted by the rulers, right? Now look what the early church says about this suffering. Verse 27, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed. Stop. Compatibilism. What is being stated there? The actual names and groups of people who by the choices they made came together and conspired to crucify Jesus. You see that? Herod, Pontius Pilate, the people of Israel, and the Gentiles. He basically encapsulates everything. So that's one. But then what does it say? 
They did, now I'll just read the NIV, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. That's not a bad translation. So we have the actions of these groups of people to crucify Christ, but look what it says. Who, now the, the more literal translations will say, what you predestined to take place, which is actually more of an accurate represent, representation of the Greek word. And your hand so what your hand and your predestination decided would take place beforehand. So, remember what's our compatibilism formula. Is it sufficient to just say that these people put Jesus to death and that's the only explanation for why it happened? Not in this text. Is it sufficient to just say God put Jesus on the cross? I suppose, once again, he could have done that. He could have sent some angels and just crucified Jesus himself. But he used human agency. See how both things are true at the same time? It's compatible. God planned it. And actually Calvin, if you look at his commentary, he really gets on the word his hand. Because he really wants to emphasize. He says the Holy Spirit put that word in there because God was intimately involved in it. It wasn't just like he was... When when the Bible talks about God's hand doing something, he wants you to know he's involved. He was involved in that. And then look what it says. Now, Lord, so so they're they're reminding themselves that even in the crucifixion of Christ, that was God's will unfolding. And in the same way, now that they're suffering, they remind themselves of that. This is what we should do, church. Remind yourself, whatever suffering you're going through, your Lord was put under way worse suffering by the hand of God. Now, most Christians believe that. They can be as libertarian as a day is long and think everything's about free will. But I remember having debates in seminary with other. But if you say, well, was it God's will and plan that Jesus died on the cross? Well, yeah, I guess that one is not too much free will involved. Exactly. That was God's plan. His predestined plan. So when we're suffering, and look what the early church did. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Wow. Wow. All right, go back to Matthew 18. Hands, eyes, and feet. So, what's up with this part? Matthew 18, verse 8. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Now, it's interesting, this this was already taught by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. It's very interesting that it's placed in this teaching. Now, first of all, let me say, you can make an application, which I'm going to in a minute, to just sanctification, fighting your sin in general, but you can't do that. This text, you can't afford to do that. This is about eternal salvation. This is about, if you don't do what Jesus is about to tell you to do here, you will go to the eternal fire, it says. Do you see that? So this isn't about, well, Jesus is saying you need to fight your sin effectively or else you'll go to hell. It, it can't mean that. That would contradict other parts of Scripture. So what the heck is he talking about then? So I'm going to compare Peter and Judas real quick. What does Peter do with his eyes, his hands, his feet? What does Judas do with his eyes, his hands, his feet? Peter, remember in Matthew 16, get behind me, Satan. You are a scandal on to me, a stumbling block. That word is used of Peter. What does Peter do with his hands, for example, in light of this unfold? Because remember, suffering is about to happen. This, this thing is about to come in. Woe to the one who, through whom it comes, but it must come. How is Peter going to respond to that? Well, look what he does. He, what is, remember what Peter does when Jesus is getting arrested? He pulls his sword with his hand to stop the will of God. His eyes don't see the purpose behind the events. So he's seeing this unfold with his eyes. And what's he doing? His interpretation is, I've got to stop this. He pulls his sword. 
And he uses his feet to flee where he ends up standing and denying Jesus. He runs. And then he ends up with the, with, with the, around the, the servants who are like, well, you're with him. I wasn't with him. So here on, Peter failed miserably. Thank God for grace. Because Peter deserves hell, according to Jesus, doesn't he? He had both his eyes and his feet and his hands, I'm pretty sure. What did he not do? He failed to do what Jesus did. Now, what did Judas do? So Judas, and I don't got time to go into this, but basically the way Mark tells the story and if you can combine that with John, the main re- the, the last straw for Judas was when the, it wasn't going to be a kingdom about money. That really seems like when Judas lost it. It was when the perfume was put on Jesus, it was worth all that money, and, and Judas was like, "Why should we should have sold that and got money. And when Jesus rebuked him, that's when, P, according to Mark, that's when Judas went out and agreed to betray him. So it wasn't about money. So Christianity is not about money. Who would have thought? <laughs> you would, wouldn't know that. Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry about that. Okay. He went. What did he do with his feet? So once Judas saw with his eyes that this is not going to be an earthly kingdom like I want that's going to enrich me, he went with his feet to the Sanhedrin. He used his hands to accept 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. Okay? He didn't cut off his hand or gouge out his eyes. He, he, he took action and saw, and he saw something that he didn't agree with. So in, in a way, Peter and Judas are the same. They're just coming from different angles. They both agree that what Jesus is about to do is not of God. It can't be of God. He's not going to go suffer. And Peter has his own reasons for thinking this, and Judas has his own reasons for thinking this. Then, in John's version of the Lord's Supper, Satan actually enters Judas as soon as he eats the bread that he hands him. And by the way, what's another thing? When Jesus announces who's going to betray him, what does he say in Matthew? The one whose hand takes this bread. He actually uses the word hand. It's a direct connection to this text. And then, once Judas saw what they intended to do, he used his feet to return to the Sanhedrin. And threw back the pieces of silver. Then he used his feet to go somewhere. He used his hands to tie a rope and hang himself. So we got these two. It's, it's instructive for us, church. We're supposed to look at this. Okay? What does Peter do and what does Judas do? They do the same basic thing. What's the difference? Well, we'll get to the difference in a minute. But let me do, let me do a couple application points here. When God gives us, you know what the Puritans called suffering? They called it a hard providence. I love that saying. When God gives you a hard providence, what's the pro- the providence of God? Is God brings things into being, into existence? He is He is sovereign over what happens, and it's a hard providence. What should we do? Well, we should do what Jesus said. There is an application to this. We should gouge out our eyes and cut off our hands and cut off our feet. Not literally, but what do you do with your hands when you're faced with suffering in this fallen, cursed world? What do you use your hands to do? Do you use them to sin? Do you use them to distract yourself, to numb yourself, to build things that will not last and satisfy? Or do we use our hands to fold them in prayer, open up the Bible? We should use them to reach out to other believers, right, who can encourage us. What do we do with our eyes? When we see suffering, pain, and evil, are you able to see beyond that reality in front of you? Knowing there's another dimension like we talked about where God is working this for our good. Are you gouging your eyes out? Figuratively. The eyes that only see the one dimensional reality and don't see past the suffering to the glory that will be revealed. Because as Paul says in Romans 8, The suffering that we are experiencing is light and momentary compared to the glory that will be revealed. In our feet. Where do our feet take us when things don't go the way we think they should? Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. And what does 1 John say? We should walk in the light as he is in the light. So what we do with our eyes, our hands, and our feet is super important. But don't forget, 
that's not the main purpose of this text. The main purpose of this text is what are you doing with the cross of Christ? Do you see what God did there? Do you see his purpose there? And do you see that you are no better than Peter and Judas? And that the only hope for you is the mercy of God. Now, this is a tough one, but we're closing now. Matthew 18, 10 to 14. See, and now he, ta- now he shifts analogy. Jesus does this all the time. Right in the middle of a teaching, he shifts to a totally different analogy of a sheep. And then he says, see that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Okay, this, this text doesn't teach that every baby has a guardian angel. He's clearly talking about the ones who believe in me. I forgot to say that earlier. Children isn't just children in general here. It's those who believe in Jesus. It's an analogy. A child is the one who believes in him. Okay. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 who did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. Why does Peter return to Christ in brokenness and faith and Judas does not? We have two answers to that and it's called compatibilism. Number one, because Judas chose not to and Judas did not want to. But if you look at Luke, you don't have to turn that, I'll read it. Luke 22, 31. You can write that one down. Luke 22, 31. Look what Jesus says to Peter, but never says this to Judas. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now, people who are just into libertarianism to the nth degree, they have to say that there's a chance Jesus' prayer might, right there might not have been answered if Peter refused to cooperate. Because Jesus just said, I'm, Peter, I, I said a prayer for you real quick. That your faith may not fail. And we'll see if, how, if that happens or not. No, when Jesus prays for you, the Father doesn't say no. Are we all clear on that? So, Peter, just as guilty as Judas in the sense of he betrayed Christ, he denied him, he fled. Jesus says, I prayed for you. Believer, Jesus intercedes for you, according to Romans 8. He's at the right hand of God. Jesus went after Peter, is what I'm saying. That's called grace. That's called mercy. Peter was not worthy of it. Peter didn't earn it. Jesus would have been just just to leave Peter in his sin. Why do you think Jesus said, peace be with you, every time after his resurrection appearance to the disciples? Because they probably thought he was coming to judge them. That's what I would have thought. This guy just, he, he's over, this is the second coming. I'm, it's over. He's going to judge me. Peace be with you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Your sins are forgiven. So, beloved, we need these eyes to see. We need these ears to hear. We need these hearts to understand that what happened to Jesus was the plan of God to bring about our forgiveness. Okay? God did that. And that, this is what's so beautiful. That's the gospel, right? That's the basic gospel message. That we are sinners. We deserve hell. Jesus Christ was sent to take that on himself, on the cross, for his elect, to take that sin upon himself. And we trust upon him. And we are clothed in his righteousness and our sins are forgiven, right? But listen, that is not just, okay, now I'm going to go to heaven when I die. That's cool. Everything else in life is kind of like a, you know, random. No, that same message, God put Jesus on the cross for my salvation, is God is in control of all the suffering I'm going through as well. You see the connection? It's not just, oh, there's my ticket to heaven when I die. No. No. In light of the cross, 
for what it teaches about God's sovereignty, I can now live every day when painful things happen. If I have a loved one who's running away from the faith, I know God can seek them like the lost sheep. Or do you doubt that? Well, you know, God's got, you know, he's got to deal with their free will. I mean, God can't really overcome that. That's the law of rock he created too heavy for him to lift. No. But I'm going to get deep for a second. But what if God, in his sovereignty, chooses to not save your child? Well, that's also part of his sovereignty. All we can do is cry out and pray, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. God, I know you're sovereign. And, and, and this is compatibilism. God's in control of that. But we must pray. We must seek. We must do everything we can. You know, reach out to the people that you love that are not following Christ right now. And say, I love you. You know, whatever you can do. But know that you can trust in an almighty God. It's a paradox though, right? It's either got to be one or the other. No, it's both. It's both. So as we close... Jesus preparing his disciples for this as we go through Matthew is the same as with us. And we can be assured that he is in control. Amen. His plan is being worked out. Well, at the same time, we do what he's commanded us to do. Jesus, I thank you for this time. And Lord, as we uh, transition to the Lord's Supper, Lord, I just pray that what we heard in this text would become real in our lives. That the same way that body was broken and that blood was shed as part of God's plan, we can trust, A, that our salvation is secure, and B, that whatever breaking you bring into our lives is for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.